Welcome to CSC 31, lecture 19. So starting from this lecture, we're going to go into the last topic of our CSC 30 curriculum. It's going to be confusing. I'm uh, giving you a, a head of warning because, because this is completely a new um, idea to you. So even though some of you may have played with computer hardware, build your own computer desktop before, but concept inside the CPU may be a little bit um, abstract to you because we can pry it open and see how it works. And also it requires some of the um, electronic um, classes skills, which you may have not taken. So for example, CSC, uh, not CSC, the engineering 65 circuit theory, right? So, but that's okay. I'll try to tone down those um, ideas so that you get the overview of the functionality of those um, devices. And that's all you need. I'm not going to test you on the detail of how CPU is created or something like that. All we care is how the CPU can understand our zeros and ones, right? Because all the instructions are in zeros and ones, right? So now how CPU can understand it and then perform the actions it requires to finish the instruction. Okay, so stay tuned. Okay, before we go into the CPU topic, um, here is the announcement. Project two is due on Monday. So actually you have only five more days to finish it. So try to uh, finish it as soon as possible because the, the demo will start Tuesday. Okay, so Monday night, once I receive all your submission, I will run the similarity test. And then on Tuesday, I will inform your TA, the similarity test result. And starting on Tuesday, during lab hours, you can um, demo your project to, to your TA. And for those who are in Monday's lab, you can either do the demo in another lab sessions with your same TA, because your TA have another, has another session. So each TA, I think, has two lab sessions. So if um, you are on the Mondays, um, you are in the Monday's lab, just find out when your TA is doing the lab, okay? And then you can just go to his or her lab, other labs to do the demo. Or you can arrange with your TA to, to do the demo during the office hour. So I think maybe you can arrange it so that you can do it during the exam week so that um, the TA is time is more flexible. Okay. And since this is towards the end of a semester, I cannot um, allow resubmission anymore. So if your program doesn't work, then it doesn't work. And you just get whatever score according to the rubric. Yeah, so because like, like project one is just taking us, take, taking me too much time to, to do all the bookkeeping. So, so which means that Testing your program is important. Before you submit, make sure you test your program and it runs correctly. Okay, so whatever you get is whatever you get. Okay, so, so the responsibility of making sure your program is correct, your submission is correct, is on you. Okay, so submitting a wrong file is not going to be a good excuse when you go to industry. So make sure you learn how to um, be professional, okay, so to, to do what you're expected to do okay? so that in the real situation when you go to the industry, you won't get into trouble because if you submit a wrong file, commit a wrong file into GitHub for your, for your project team and they can't they can make use of your, your file, then you're in trouble. It doesn't matter, okay, what, what your excuse is okay? because you are supposed to double check, triple check, check, quadruple check. So, so make sure you uh, build up this kind of um, um, habit. Okay, so CSE 31 is still early on in your academic career. So make sure that you start uh, culture this um, attitude. Okay, so, so don't rely on your instructor, your TA, anyone else, because your work, your score is 
based on your performance, okay, your attitude. So, so keep that in mind because not many instructors are that lenient, right? So, especially once you go into upper division, they we will expect you to know what to expect, okay? And lap nine again, lap nine is your last lap, so finish it and do the demo to your TA. And also we have homework seven. Homework seven is only like one couple problems, very short. So you should be able to finish it by Monday. It's about um, floating point conversion and which is the same topic that you're gonna have for exam next week. Okay. And in the meantime, um, do the reading assignment. And I know the reading assignment is kind of long, but just follow the activities and you'll get the idea okay, on how the CPU works. And here is a list of exam topics. Okay, so we are gonna have, and the recording day today is Wednesday. So we're gonna have um, C to MIPS conversion today. And then next Wednesday, we're going to have the floating point numbers conversion as well as regular integer conversion, which is covered um, in your midterm one. And then during the final exam time, okay, um, check, double check your schedule. It's going to be on Saturday and it's going to be three hours. So what I will do is I'll split the exam into two or even possible three okay, so that we can again reduce the, the, the anxiety of losing your internet service. Okay, so, so what happened is that I will try to separate the exam problems so that um, so that um, you can focus on one or two problems at a time okay, instead of try to juggle uh, between many problems within a given time. Because I want to limit the time uh, to a shorter time so that um, we don't have to worry too much about the internet connections. Okay, so just keep that in mind. Um, I'll post more information about the final um, to uh, the exam, the last exam on Saturday. Okay? All right, so this is what we have learned so far. We learned how our program is transformed so that our computer can run it, right? So we learned that in a couple of lectures ago. We have our C code, the compiler will convert the C to assembly language. And the assembler will convert the assembly language to object code, which is pretty much machine language already. But by itself, the object code cannot be executed because it's just individual program, right? So it doesn't link the library, for example, or link other object codes together. Okay, so now the job to link everything together is linker. It's okay, so a linker will combine everything so that it produces a final executable. And this is what you double click on or you do dot slash and then your program name. Okay. And this program is pretty much ex uh, machine code, right? zeros and ones all the way. And by itself, it doesn't run. So after the linker process, this file is saved usually in your hard drive. Okay. So, so because you are not executing it. Only when you double click it or you do start, dot slash the file name, now the operating system contains a loader. The loader will load the file, again, this is just zeros and ones, right? From the hard drive and save it into the memory. And this is where the actual execution starts. So now it becomes the communication between the memory and the CPU to do the actual running of the program. So the CPU will go to the memory, take one instruction at a time, well, technically it's more, but but again, CPU can only handle one instruction at a time okay, so because there's only one brain. And then it will take in the instruction, understand what it is, and then execute it. And when it's done, now it's time to do the second instruction and so forth. And this is what we're gonna talk about today. Okay? So here is the structure of the whole machine. So in the user level, we have our application, the programs that we write, or the programs that we use, right? For example, I'm using a browser, or I'm using a Zoom to record the video right now. And 
on top of these individual programs, there is a big gigantic program called operating system. And the operating system pretty much controls every program that you have, okay, including compilers and assembler. And so these two are considered as one like in GCC. So with different operating system, you have different version of apps and, and a compilers, which makes sense. So even though you have GCC in your computer, but it also depends on what kind of uh, operating system. So you, you, if you use um, Mac, then you have your Xcode versions of uh, GCC. If you use Windows, most likely you have to use um, um, the WG main, or you need to use the Windows subsystem, the batch, in order to use the GCC, right? So it all depends on the operating system, okay? So that's software. Now, the other hand will be the hardware, okay? So you have the processor, the CPU, you have the memory, and you have the IO, and we'll talk more about that. Like IO basically is like your, your keyboard, your mouse, your monitor, right? And then underneath this, uh, the detailed hardware implementation. So you can see that things can get very complicated one by one. And beyond the blue circle, you will probably learn these three topics, digital design, circuit design, and transistor in more like an electrical engineering class instead of computer science class. And of course, if we offer computer engineering class, then we'll have that. But unfortunately, because of the size of our campus, we cannot afford this at this moment. But it is an interesting um, topic to, to learn. Okay, so now the thing is, on top of here, we have software, everything zeros and ones, right? And here is hardware. So the question is, how do we connect these two, right? So even until when you run the program, your program is stored in memory, right? But it's still zeros and ones. So how does the content in the memory or how it is interacted with the actual physical processor or input output, right? How do we transfer the zeros and ones okay, into the processor? or into the I.O., right, or, or either way, and transform these zeros and ones to meaningful actions. So this is the science behind computer science. Right? Okay, so, so what does that do? We have to have what we call instruction set architecture. So this is what architecture means. So architecture means how the hardware, in construct, uh, how the hardware is constructed so that it, in under, it understands your program. So that's pretty much what um, instruction set architecture means. So usually we say ISA, okay? So basically it is an abstraction, it's an abstraction. What it means is that it governs how the zeros and ones are interpreted. Okay, so basically this is kind of like a mapping of zeros and ones and the actions, or you can say the contract between hardware and software. So which means that different CPU, different types of CPU will have different architecture, which means that there will be a different set of architecture, different set of instructions. So for example, MIPS, okay? When we write MIPS assembly language, we have a different structure compared to like Intel. Okay? So if you Google around how to write Intel um, assembly language, you will be glad that we, we didn't teach that. Okay, a lot of schools actually teach Intel uh, um, um, assembly language, but actually, in my opinion, it is a lot harder to learn because Intel's architecture is not very structured. Okay, so it's a very complex architecture, and it's not really a good idea for for beginner to learn. So. That's why I, I stick with MIPS. And MIPS is actually very similar to um, ARM, so ARM CPU. So that's why I think if you know MIPS, you just need to um, study a little bit and then you learn um, how to code in ARM, which is very good, okay? Because a lot of um, small chips are ARM CPU now. Okay, so, and, and so like a lot of in the internet of things, right? So your Alexa devices, 
most of them are run um, with um, the ARM CPU. So if you know how to program MIPS, then it's very easy to pick up how to program ARM CPU. And then, it's, then you have a very high, higher chance to be hired to, to, to work for the companies that deals with these kind of chips. Okay, so just think about it. So over the summer, learn how to program assembly language. It's getting very popular now because uh, your past generation probably don't know how to program assembly language anymore because they don't really, they didn't really focus on this topic a lot. But I think now this topic becomes popular again. So, so you have an edge now. So this is what we have learned, right? In this week's exam, <clears throat> we learned the translation between C and MIPS. In the past exam, we learned the translation between MIPS or assembly language and series and ones. Now the question is, what's next? Okay. We know that CPU understands series and ones, but how? Right. So let's find out how the CPU can understand this kind of thing, right? Because by looking at zeros and ones, what does that mean to the CPU? So think about ourselves as a CPU again. So pretty much for this class, we have to treat ourselves as CPU in order to be able to understand the whole process. So now giving you a line of zeros and ones, what do you do with that? If you know that this is a, C, uh, a program code, what do you do? you want to find a way to figure out what it means, right? And by, by translating these zeros and ones back to an assembly code, then we know what it does, right? So same thing, CPU needs to be able to do that. By knowing how to extract information from the zeros and ones, then the CPU will continue on and do the job. Okay, so this is what exactly happens. So of course, the CPU won't translate the zeros and ones back to assembly language because it doesn't read, right, the, the text. So all it does is, based on the zeros and ones, it, it will decide what to do. So basically, this is what we call digital logic, a logical digital system. Okay, so we'll talk more about that in the next lecture. Today, I'll just give you an overview of what it takes. Okay, what are the overview process of overall process of the CPU? Okay, so before we go into the detail of the, thing, uh, the steps, let's take a look at the CPU itself, okay? A CPU, sometimes we call that processor, so processor is more proper in architecture instead of CPU, okay? Um, a processor, so for example, MIPS or CP, um, Intel, AMD, ARM, okay, or RISC-V, okay, so the new open source one, so again, if you really want to find a good job, learn how to program in RISC-5, R-I-C, R-I-S-C, okay, um, five. So this is very similar to MIPS. It's just a variation of MIPS. Okay, so so this, this is an open source CPU. Many companies are investing in it um, to develop their own CPU you know, because of that. So it, it is a very exciting field to study now, okay? So, Whatever um, hardware we talk about, they are considered as what we call synchronous digital system. So it is a system because it's a bunch of hardware connected together. So that's why it's called system. And synchronous, so synchronous means what? Have you seen um, the Olympic synchronous diving? Okay, so you have two guys or two girls standing each uh, next to each other right, in the, on the on the diving board and they try to swing and jump and shoot in, down to the water, right? And while they're doing the things together, right? So this is called synchronous. So, but on the other hand, if you play music, same thing, right? Music is a synchronous process. Why? Because you play your notes according to the beats, right? To the rhythm. Okay, so, so this is what it means by synchronous. So, every action in this processor will follow a rhythm, which is the clock. And that's why when you buy a CPU, um, they always label 
the clock speed, the, how fast is your CPU, right? So, so now the fastest CPU is about five gigahertz, which means that you have five times 10 to the power of nine um, um, cycles per second, right? So this is the clock. So basically every single clock cycle, it will supposed to do an action. So this is called synchronous system. And what about digital? Digital means high and low, that's all. So one's or zero. So high voltage, low voltage. So for a CPU, usually it high means like three volts and low means zero volt. So that's basically you just have up and down, up and down to define the signal. Okay, so instead of analog that you have like a sine wave. So, all right. And if you open up your CPU, okay, so when you open up your computer, you, you, you see a CPU with a silver top. And the silver top basically is a heat sink. Okay, so the CPU is not that big. But when you ply open the heat sink, okay, the silver cover, you see the actual CPU probably as big as your nail. Okay, so it's not that big. Okay, I think it's probably smaller than your, maybe as big as your thumb, thumbnail. Okay, so that's all. And when you use the microscope to look into it, you will see the layout. Okay, so, and in this class, um, we didn't really have a chance to cover cache. So cache basically is just a small version of your memory inside your CPU. Okay, so, so what happened is that memory is outside of your CPU. And during the runtime, you have programs are, and data are in the CPU, in the memory, but your actions are in the CPU. So now in order to run your program, you have to go to this memory to get the data. And it comes back to the, CPU to work on those data, which is just too far, too slow. Okay. Anything that runs outside of your CPU would be very slow. Okay, so, so it doesn't make sense. And that's why in our CPU, we always have cache. So you have the data cache to store your data. Okay, for example, your heap memory data, your static memory data, your stack memory data. And you also have a cache for your instruction. Okay, so, so that your, your, um, your next few data that you're planning to use or instruction will be here so that you don't have to go to the memory all the time. So pretty uh, useful. Okay, but unfortunately, because of the situation right now, I have to skip this topic. But at the end of the semester, I will post the lectures like on, on tech courses so that you can take a look at them. Okay? And also, I have actually assigned a sidebook reading activity for you to read about that. I think it's in chapter six. Okay, so, so that should give you some idea of how cache works. But again, I'm not gonna ask you uh, in your exam. And you are supposed to learn this again in architecture class. So, so do take architecture class because it's very important class. As I mentioned that everything is internet of things now. Software is important, but now, okay, after two, almost two decades of focusing on improving software, now seems like it's about time to go back to hardware to utilize the, the, the performance of hardware to uh, make up the, the miss uh, from the software. So you see more and more hardware development, especially given that the, the open source hardware CPU is so popular now. Okay, so try to take that class in, in, in the next semester because once you still remember MIPS and stuff like this, take it as soon as possible so that you don't have a hard, you won't have a hard time to try to catch up. Okay. So, so now let's look, look into the CPU okay, itself and see what it actually does. So again, I'm not gonna talk about the actual electronics of it. Okay, so it's just too much to cover because it takes several semesters to learn the actual hardware. Okay, so we just talk about the overview of what it does, okay? All right, so if you look into it, pretty much all CPUs or any hardware in your computers are chunks of what we call transistors. And transistors are many, there are many types, and usually in CPU, in your memory, they are called MOSFET, okay? Metal Oxide Semiconductor Field Effect um, Transistor. So, a very long name. So what it does is just that 
um, based on the difference of the voltage here and you allow uh, actually G and S and you allow the signal to pass through or not. So kind of like a gate. Okay, so if you want to think about it. Okay, so I'm not going to talk too much about that, but basically, and this is called field effect, right? So, so basically it has something to do with magnetic field. Okay, so because it's in the electronic electron level. Okay, so, so, so basically based on different organization of this tiny little transistor, and then you will create a functional unit of it. So, so for example, if I want to create a NAN operator, so NAN means what? The opposite of N. So I have A, I have B, so this is a true table of N, NAN, right? So only when both are ones, you get a zero, the rest are one. So can, it's the opposite of N, right? So how do we make this work? How do we make this kind of function? Well, we just organize our um, transistor in this way. Then you have A and B, okay? You can see that A and not A. So with, whenever you see a circle is an opposite, okay? So, and then now C will be here. So you can see that basically it's just a different organization of transistor and then you create a general functional unit. And that's all we do, okay? And we're gonna just learn the basic functionality, that's all, okay? We are not gonna learn this. Okay? This takes at least one to two semesters to learn, so, so it's impossible to learn it in one or two classes, okay? And even this, okay, so I'm not expecting you to, to, to um, understand what's inside. All we care is the action, giving you two input, if this is an end, what to be expected as output, that's all. If input A is one, input B is zero, what will be C? Well, input A is one, input B is zero, C will be one, that's all. That's all I expect you to know, okay? To be able to do. And you, you see exercises in Zybox as well too, so just make sure to, to work on those. Okay, so let's go back to your computer. So if you apply open your computer, so don't do this until final because you still need, until after the final, because you still need your computer to do your exam, okay? And you see several components and we call that five major components of computer. What are they? We have input, any devices that transfer um, input to the computer. Okay, so we'll read information to the computer. For example, keyboard, mouse, your thumb drive, right? Because you transfer from externally, right? And scanner or microphone. So these are all um, input. What about output? Output is the opposite, that you can export information from your computer. So for example, your display, your printer, your um, speaker. So these are all output. Okay? So it, it provide you the information. Okay? And then the third component is your memory. Okay? So memory is your RAM basically, RAM, random access memory. So this is where your program and your data are stored during runtime. So, so you have the hard drive and then, and hard drive actually is also considered as input device too. And, and then now when you run the program, your program will be stored in memory. And then the last two components are from your processor and it is broken into data path and control. So we'll talk more about these two. Um, and this CPU okay, is the actual brain that process what's in the memory. Okay, so there's a connection between these two. And now the CPU manufacturers or motherboard chipset manufacturer job is to design a piece of hardware that can make this communication channel fast. Okay? Because this is pretty much the bottleneck for nowadays computer. Okay, so we, we have a fast processor, but the communications between the processor and memory okay, is limited. So no matter how fast your memory is, it's not gonna be as fast as your CPU. So that's the problem. So how can we make the whole process faster? 
Okay, so now let's take a look at the definition of CPU. So CPU, okay, usually uh, different um, people will use different terms, so they are meaning the same thing. Processors, um, central processing unit, so they are the same thing. Okay? It is the active part of the, C the computer that does all the work. Okay, so, so, so memory just store the program and data and I.O. are just the communications of information. Okay, but the processing of information lies in the CPU. And the CPU is divided into two major tasks. The first one is data path. Data path is a piece of hardware that transforms your information. Okay, so that's the actual transformation. Um, that's the place where the actual transformation takes place. Okay? And of course, in order to do that, you need to have a control unit to, to allow the data path to transform the information. So I always like to use choo-choo tree as um, an analogy. Okay, so if you think about choo-choo tree, so I'm not sure whether you used to play Thomas train when you were little or some kind of train set. Okay, so if you think about train, right? Um, even like BART, uh, BART um, railway system. Okay, so um, you have the railroad system already. So all the tracks are laid out already, which is the data path. So you can consider data path as the whole railroad network. But not all trains go through all the stations, right? all the rails, right? So how does each train know which station to go through? Well, that depends on the controller, right? So there's a central controller to, con to tell the Conductor, is it called conductor or engineer? It should be engineer, right? The train engineer, uh, which uh, track to go, right? So you, you see those track, uh, what do we call that? I forgot what the term. Like you, you can control, there's a Y split, right? To, to allow the, the train to, to go to either left or right of the rail track, right? So same thing. So this is the job of the control, okay? So giving you the zeros and ones. And then the CPU or the control will look into the, the code and find out what it means. And once it knows what it means, now it will send out the sig control signal to the data path to open the right path so that your information will be transformed. And then by the end of the clock cycle, it will provide you the right answer. So this is how the CPU works. Okay. So we'll go into detail. So now we mentioned that, right? We, um, the CPU takes in zeros and ones and the final product will be whatever the um, expected result of that um, instruction is, right? Or of that program is, right? So one line at a time. So it makes sense that to create a big gigantic black box, right? Just like the, remember that NAND unit, right? You have the input, the input will be zero and ones. Output will be the, the result of that operation, right? So we can create a big gigantic um, black box, just like the NAND, and then inside, it will just do everything. But what is the problem of that? So with the NAND, we, we already see that it takes like up to like four transistors to do just one, one operation, which is the NAND. Now, what can a CPU do? A lot of things, right? So now you want to lump everything into this box. Now this box will be a gigantic box. Okay. So think about if I assign you a big program, pro big programming project, even bigger than your project one. Okay. But what I want you to do is write everything into the main program, main function. You will cry. I will cry too. Okay. Because it's really hard. Because if a project involves so many tasks, it doesn't make sense to put them into one gigantic box because it will make that box very complex. And then probably even by uh, looking, using a variable will be very difficult too because that variable maybe depends on a lot of other variables within the gigantic box. Right? So, so that's why 
it doesn't make sense to design a hardware that is so complicated because the, the more complicated it is, the hardware it is, um, the harder to manufacture. Okay, so that's why Intel always has a hard time to improve and fabricate their hardware compared to um, um, CPU because the nature of the hardware, Intel is always more complicated. Okay, so in CSC 140, you learn why Intel has an inherent problem. Okay, so that's why it's not fair to, to keep saying that Intel is not as good as, um, um, as um, CPU because inside there are two completely different architecture. So that's why we cannot just use one measure to, to measure that thing. So, but anyway, so in hardware, simple is always good. So you have learned that already in assembly language. Simple means good, right? So that's why we want to make sure that our CPU hardware is simple. So how can we make the gigantic block simple? How do you make your gigantic main function simple? Well, Break it up, right? So instead of making everything, writing every code inside your main, now you just take out individual individual functionality into functions, right? So so that your main will call out a function, and then a function will call another function, so that your program will work in the same way. Okay? But now instead of uh, having just one gigantic main function, you have multiple smaller and cleaner functions. Okay that work within itself, okay? So this is what we call stages. Okay? So it takes several stages to um, finish the product. So come, um, you can also think about um, uh, it as an assembly line okay? uh, in a factory, okay? So, or uh, I like to use cooking again, okay? So making a cake, right? You will wish that there's a machine in Amazon that you can buy and all you need to do is just put every ingredient in and then press a button, it will pop out a cake for you, right? So of course it would be nice, but I'm sure this machine will be difficult to make and it will cost a lot and probably um, it can only make one cake for you, right? Or make one type of cake, okay? So, so, so but if we can create an assembly line, okay? So that one, one, um, Hardware we just do the gathering of ingredient and mix that, and now you take it, take out the output, right, and then get this mixture and put it into the other machine, okay, and this machine will bake it, right. So you can see that by separating the task into um, stages, now you can create a specific hardware for that task only, which is a lot simpler. Make sense? Okay, so this is the science behind the data path. Okay, so basically the data path is just a, a tree to train network that goes through different stations and each stations will perform a certain fixed task. Okay? And then you just need to go from one task to another task until the end you have the final product. Okay? So now because these stages are independent and you can always uh, modify each stage without affecting the next uh, stages. Okay, so which is uh, why okay we want to do that in, in, in that design. All right, <clears throat> so what are they? So think about if we are the CPU, how, what what should we do? Okay, what will be our process of um executing one instruction, zeros and ones, let's say, okay? So now think about it, okay? When we run the program, okay, so again, you are the CPU, all right? And a user type in dot slash and then a dot out. What is your job now? So where is your program, first of all? In your CPU? No, right, the program is in the memory. So what is your first step then? So memory is not in the CPU, right? And you are the CPU. So what you, do you do first? Run the, run the zeros and ones? No, but you go to the memory to get the instruction, right? So this is your first step. So 
because CPU does not have the instruction, right? You have to go to the memory to fetch that. Okay, so, so again, with the CPU um, diagram in the path, um, the photo, we saw that there's an instruction cache, right? So this is where you can fetch the instruction. Okay? So if you don't have the cache, then you have to go to the memory to get it. Okay. So but again, the cache is just a a temporary storage version of your memory. So you still need to go to the memory to get that instruction so that you can store that into your cache. Okay, so, so same idea. So you still need to get it, okay? So the first step. So, so it doesn't matter what type it is, okay? Because it is 32 bits, right? So you don't care. Okay, so this is not your job. The first stage, you just go to the memory and get that 32 bit zeros and one. But at the same time, you increment your PC. What is PC again? PC is the address of your current instruction. Okay. And that's how you know where to get the instruction in the memory. You have your PC. The PC is the address of your instruction, right? So you go to the memory at this address, PC address, fetch the instruction. Okay. Now, once you fetch the instru instruction, you don't need this PC anymore. Why? Because you have the instruction, right? So now what do you do? I would add four to my PC. Why? What does that mean by adding four? Why is it? What is this four magic number? Four bytes, right? When you add four bytes to your current address, what does that mean? You are thinking about your next instruction. Okay. okay so, so which means that once you fetch your instruction, you prepare for the next instruction so that when this instruction is done, you are ready to get the next instruction. Sounds good? And that's why when we count the branch, mm -hmm, here is the answer. Why do we start counting the immediate from your next line? Why not your current line, the branch line? Remember that? Okay. In your last exam, we talked about, we have this problem too, right? I have a branch statement and the, the label is either under, before the branch statement or after the branch statement. But doesn't matter, the immediate of this instruction, branch instruction, always start counting from the next line of your branch instruction. Remember that? Yes, right? So and this is the reason why. Because by the time you try to do the assembler, okay, or you want to convert that into the assembly language, okay, the compiler, your PC is already pointing at the next instruction already. And that's why you have to start counting from the next instruction. And this is the reason, okay? Right? Okay, so next one, what do you do? Now you have the series and ones, the second stage will be decoding, right? So what does that mean? It means that from this zeros and ones, find out what you're, you are asked to do. Okay. okay, so just like in your last exam, right? I give you a bunch of zeros and ones. What does that mean? So do you know what to do? by zeros and ones. What is the first step? You read the opcode, right? Once you know the opcode, you know how to divide, right? If, if opcode is zero, what does that mean? I format, R format, J format? R format, right? If it's R format, you know how many fields you are supposed to break it into, right? Six fields. And because of that, you can find out what function code is. So that's the operation. And then you have the three registers, right? Or the shift amount, right? So, so basically based on this opcode, you know the rest of the instruction, okay? And then not just knowing, okay? So in this decoding stage, besides knowing what operator is, you also go to the register to grab those data to prepare for the execution. So in instruction decode, the decoding stage, you understand what the code is and then prepare the operator, okay? Okay, so for example, this is an ad. So if it is an ad, you need to read the register to get these two RS and RT, okay, ready. So which means that by the end of this stage, you need to prepare the operator, okay? which means that what kind of operation it is, and then prepare the data to operate on, all right? So this is the second stage. What if it, it is um, 
um, I format. Then you need to prepare one register, which means that you need to read the register and also prepare to find out where to get the immediate. Okay, so get all these operands ready. So basically at the end of this stage, you need to provide all this information to the next stage. Okay, so, so this is the end of this um, station. Okay. And if it's JL, you don't need to do anything because um, once you decode, you know the address already. And then all you need to do is just for the next stage to actually jump to that location. Next, once you have all this information, right? You know what the operator is, you know the operands are. Now the third stage is to actually do the um, um, execution. So we call the ALU, arithmetic logic unit, the ALU stage or execution stage. So this is the actual processing um, happening. Okay? So the basic operation, the arith arithmetic, the logical, like and or shifting, or even comparison. So these are all done in this stage. Okay? So your add i, add or i, and division, multiplication, shift, and 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 compare. They are all done in this stage, provided that your second stage decoding um, supplies the operands to you. So what about lower and store Do they utilize this stage, or they just don't? get off the train. Does low word require ALU stage? What do you think? Look at this statement. What does that do? You are loading something from this address, right? So this is your base address and this is the offset, right? So you need to add them together and this, the sum will be the final address. So now you have the final address, you go there and grab the data and save it into T0, right? So do you need to add? Yes, so the adding of the address happens in these things, okay? So, so pretty much most of the instructions will require you to use this stage, except for jump or J, J, uh, jump and name, because it doesn't require you to do any addition and subtraction. So by the end of your decoding stage, you know the final address to jump to already. So that will end at second stage. So we'll talk more about that later. Okay. <clears throat> so we, and then next stage is the memory access stage. So for example, lower store work, right? You know the address. So now this is the time you go to the memory and get it, okay? Or to write it to it, okay? So only load and store instructions will utilize this stage, which means that other instructions, add i, add sub, will just uh, run through it. So which means that they will, remain, they will be remaining in the train without getting off the station. Okay, so, so that's what happened. Okay, so they will become idle in this stage. So that's all. Okay, so whenever an instruction doesn't utilize that stage, that stage becomes idle to that instruction. That's all. Okay, so you're just not doing anything. You're just pass through, pass, passing through. Okay, and finally is the write back stage or register write. What, what happened? When you do add, right? After you add, what do you do? You need to write the result back to the insert, uh, into register, right? Or lower, same thing, right? After you add the address, you go to the memory, load the address, and then the whatever you load will be written back into the register. Excuse me. So this is register write. Okay, so this is the last stage or the train ride. So most instruction requires that. So think about which instruction doesn't require you to write back. Okay. Well, so arithmetic, logical, load, compare, they all require you to write the result, right? So what other instructions don't require you to write the result? Okay. Store, right? You only store, which means that after the memory access, you're done. You're not writing, you're not loading anything back to the register, right? Branch, right? After you compare, you're done, right? Then you, you just go to the label, jump, right? Same thing. Once you decode, you know the label, the address, you jump there, right? So you don't have to go through these five 
the stage number five. Okay, so which means that we just pass through this five, the five uh, fifth stage, fifth stage. Okay. So you just re remain idle. So these are the five stages of your data path. Okay, so it looks very complicated. Okay, so don't worry. Okay, so treat this as your, again, choose your train ride, all right? So these are the rail track, but information won't go through every single one of them every time, okay? So the first stage, you have the instruction fetch. So in the CPU um, photo, we saw that there was a, instruction cache right so this is what happened what it is right instruction cache when you have the address you just go to the instruction memory or cache grab that instruction okay and then at the same time you add four to it okay for the next instruction so this is kind of like the buffer okay we call that buffer we call the register uh, because again this is synchronized right with the clock so when the next clock comes in the plus four will be allowed to go to here and that becomes your new PC, okay? And so in the next clock, which means that when, you do up, when you're ready to do the next instruction. So the clock governs how you go to the next instruction, okay? So this is instruction fetch. So now once you get the zeros and ones, you determine what the fields are from your instructions. Okay, so that's, that's why it's called decode. And then access the register or the immediate, and then you know what to prepare for the ALU, which is your execution. Okay, so by the end of your decoding, you should have something here to pass to the ALU unit. Okay, so different. Sh so in electronic or electrical engineering, the the circuit design, the diagram will have different shape to represent different functionality. So for example, usually square are memory. Storage, so register are storage, right? So that's what we use square. Uh, trapezoid, is it called trapezoid? Uh, I guess, right? Um, we usually use as um, a unit that perform action, okay? So that's why it's called, um, that's why it's ex execution, okay? And so now you perform the execution and eventually uh, at the end, you have the result of your execution. And then next stage, is the data or the memory stage. Okay, so memory usually here refers to data. Lower storage, they are about data, okay? So it's different from instruction. Instruction is the, at the beginning, right? So if this is lower storage, the output of your ALU is the final address you want to access, okay? So now you use that as your uh, address to access. But if you are just doing add or subtract or shift, you bypass this and just carry your output from ALU to here by passing it. Okay. And finally, you write your result back to your register. Okay, so choose your train run. Okay. Station one, station two, station three, station four, station five. Okay. Think about your bark station it stops. Okay. All right, so these are the five stages. Okay, so, so always remember from now on all the way to, I will say even, CSC 140 architecture class. Even until now, I'm still talking about five stages to my students. Okay, so in my, my, my class. Okay, so remember these five stages. Okay, use your fingers to, to um, remember that. All right, so let's walk through some examples. I have add, okay? So assume this is zeros and ones, okay? Of course, I cannot just do zeros and ones. Otherwise, this lecture would be taking forever, okay? So assume that this is zeros and ones. I'm going to read this as zeros and ones. Okay, and what do you do in the first stage? What is the first stage? Based on the PC, you go to your instruction memory or instruction cache to fetch an instruction. And what's next? Increment your PC to prepare for your next instruction, right? And then because of zeros and ones, you decode that and you know that this is add. And this, since it's our format, you need two registers, right? So you're reading your register R1 and R2, grab those value, okay? And prepare for the addition. And stage three will just add these two values and perform the addition and then create the result, right? Generate the result. And stage four, it doesn't access memory since this is an add, so you stay idle. You just, you just 
bypass this line, right? So you skip this station. And now when you arrive at station five, you perform the right back. So you perform whatever add you have, right? And then you, it contains the value now. You save it into R3. So which means that R3 does not contain the add, okay, the value, the sum after stage three. So remember that, okay? So stage three only add the two value and provide a result. But the result is not stored in R3 until this stage. So keep that in mind, okay? So R3 only stores the result in a temporary storage in the CPU. Only until stage three, the copy of the storage, the temporary storage will be put into R3. So keep that in mind, okay? So it's not automatically stored in R3 right away. Okay, so one step at a time in the CPU. So how does it work? Stage one, you base on your PC, you go to instruction memory, right? And at the same time, add four to it. So you fetch an instruction, add four to it, but it's not your PC yet. So there's a blockage, right? So the clock is controlling this gate. And when the next clock cycle comes, then you allow this new PC to be your current PC. Okay, so that creates the states, okay? the, the synchronized process. Now the decoding stage, we understand what it means, right? And then know the register numbers to access. So it reads register one, register two, and about to write into register three. Okay, so now it reads register one and two, provide the two numbers from the content of register, right? And then stage three adds this value. Okay, so you treat register as array. So what it means is you go to the register one, right? So again, registers are numbered, right? So you go to the register number one, grab it. Register number two, grab it. Perform the add, and this is the result, right? And since this is add, it has nothing to do with the memory, you just bypass it. And then stage five, you write the result back to register, which is register three. Okay. And when you're done, so five stages over, what's next? You are going to do the next PC. So now you allow the PC plus four to be your new PC now. And this is how your CPU go to the next address and grab the next instruction and continue on. So basically every clock, these five stages, will run through once. Okay, so, so basically every single clock at the end of the five stages, your CPU will allow the next PC to um, fetch, okay? Okay, so now let's do one more. Set less than I. So this is I format, right? So what does the CPU do first? Stage one, fetch an instruction, increment your PC, decoding. Now, you know, this is I format. And this is set less than immediate. Okay, so it takes in one register as input and then one immediate. So these two operands will be um, executed by comparison, which is subtraction, right? And then since this is not memory, so the memory stage will be idle, and then the result will be written into R3, whether it's R1 is less than 17. Okay, and then when it's done, now you're ready for the next instruction. Okay, so let's run through. You fetch an instruction using your PC. At the same time, you add four to it. And then now you have the zeros and ones. What do you do? You decode. And since this is I format, you only need two registers. One to read, one to write to, right? So decoding also prepare the operand okay, for the ALU. So you read in register one and you, from the instruction, you know what the immediate is already, right? So now you just, the decoding stage will prepare that, the 16 bit, right? And then third stage, you add them together and bypass the memory because you're not doing anything with the memory. And finally, you write back and you're done with this set less than immediate. And now you're ready for the next instruction by allowing the PC plus four 
to go to the um, new PC. Okay. So again, this is just a buffer to store your PC, okay? That's, or you can say register. Okay, next, store work. So store work, you read this, right? You're gonna store what's inside here to the memory address of the sum of these two, right? So you fetch the instruction, increment the PC, decode, you know that this is store, so which means that you need to read both R1 to get the address and R3 to get the data to be stored. So now you perform the addition. So again, memory uh, access needs the sum, right? Of the immediate and the register, right? So you still need to perform the sum. But now after this sum, the result is not going to the right back into the register. The result is your final address, right? So you use this result to access the memory. In this case, you're writing what's in R3 into the address that you just have the sum with, right? And then finally, since you're done, you're not writing anything back to the register. So stage five is idle. So let's do it again. You have the current PC, fetch the instruction. You have the zeros and one, and uh, actually, sorry. You have fetch the current PC and then you add four to your PC for the next instruction. And then you have the zeros and ones, you decode that. So you know that this is a store word. You're gonna read two registers, okay? One is for the address and one is for the data storage later we'll show that, okay? And you're not using it right now, so I'm highlighting it, highlighting it. So now the ALU will add 17 to the register value. And that produces the final address, okay, effective address. And now the fourth stage, we use this address and, and access the memory. So you've passed in this address, you pass in this data, okay, so this is the data in, and then store this data in this address. So you store what? The content at this address of the memory is R3, okay? And that's it. You're, you're done with that. You don't have stage five, right? So that's why after that, you are ready for the next instruction. So this is store one. <clears throat> so could we have different number of stages? Why do we have to have five stages? Five stages. Yes, we can. In fact, Intel CPU has 14 stages and that's why you don't really want to learn Intel right away, okay? And MIPS has five because five is the common denominator. It's the union of all instruction. So what instruction takes all five stages? Can you guess? Which instruction is the longest, okay? That takes all five stages. Yes, low. So let's do low word. Stage one, fetch instruction, increment PC. Stage two, decode. You know that this is low, so which means that you need to read one instruction, one register the address, right? So now you add that address to the 17. So now you have the sum address, final address. And finally, not finally, you go to this address, right, the sum, and then grab the data. But don't put that into R3 yet because you are not in fifth stage. In fifth stage, you write this add, uh, value from the memory to your register R3, okay? So low word, we use all five stages. Instruction fetch, add four to your address to prepare for the next instruction. Now you have zeros and ones, what do you do? You decode, right? Once you decode, you know that this is low word. You're gonna read the address 17 plus whatever is in R1, right? So you prepare R1 and add 17 to it and you get the final address, right? And then in the fourth stage, you go to this address and get the data, right? So that's why you are not bypassing it anymore. You use this and an address, go to the address, grab the data. And then finally, you save this data into your register three in this case, R3, right? And you're done with five stages and you're ready for the next instruction. So this is the CPU stages, the data path, okay? And again, because of the decoding, we know how to control what to go through, right? So this is the control. 
So the summary is a data path is the structure to transform our data. So basically, right? By knowing what your instruction is, then we will rearrange your data path so that the information will go to the right path and perform the operations and then produce the result. But in order to do that, we need a controller to control the path, right? Just like the engineer, right? To control the railroad so that you know whether you, you use two registers, let's say, or you use just one register and whether you do the data stage or memory stage or you do the write back stage or instruction write stage right? or, map, or register write stage, right? So, so you have the data path, right? And when you do the decoding, you know the opcode and function code and that will determine, okay? That will help the controller determine what to do with the rest, okay? Whether you use these two lines or use this line or this line or whether you use data memory or whether you use that. Um, right back, right? So, so it will control the rest of the flow of the five stages. So this is the relationship between data path and controller. And in the next lecture, I'm going to go over the data path again in detail. So I leave the controller to the very last lecture to talk about that. So we will continue to develop this diagram okay, because this diagram is only the overview of how information are traveling so that it becomes transformed, right? But we need to take care of different instruction formats, right? We have R format, I format, J format. So we will look into a little bit more detail. So we're gonna zoom in to this diagram and look into a little bit more in detail and see what kind of hardware components to be added into this diagram to make the whole um, five stages work. Okay, so this is just the, um, the stations, five stations, right? You have one, two, three, four, and then five. And we're gonna put into more smaller units to actually make the whole um, data path work, okay? So just like, how do we make the split of train track, right? So like, like this, okay? so we'll talk, that, talk more about that in the next lecture, okay? So if you have any questions, just email me or attend the office hours. I'll see you in the next lecture.